In a letter dated 22 January 1870, Massini wrote to Pike. Now, Albert Pike is this high mason who wrote this, the manual, if you like, of Scottish Freemasonry. He said the following, We must allow all of the federations to continue just as they are. It must appear as things are as they were in the beginning. With their systems, their central authorities, and diverse modes of correspondence between high grades of the same right, organized as they are at present, but we must create a super right, which will remain unknown, to which we will call those masons of high degree whom we shall select. With regard to our brothers in masonry, these men must be pledged to the strictest secrecy, through this supreme right, we will govern all Freemasonry, which will become the one international center, the more powerful, because its direction will be unknown. Now, Albert Pike wrote a letter to Mancini, and that was dated August 15, 1871, in which he propagated that there should be a world order, a one order where all nations are under the control of one central organization. And in order to achieve this, they planned, and there are numerous quotes for this, so I've put a number on the screen, because some will say, I don't trust this, I don't trust that, I don't trust the other. Here are references down there, there are references up there, there will be references in other slides, so it comes from different sources. He said, and this was, by the way, on display in the British Museum, and could be seen there until it was taken away. The First World War, to overthrow the power of the Tsars in Russia, protector of orthodoxy, and bring about an atheistic communistic state. Did that happen? Yes. Now that was written long before this event. Long before this event. This was written in 1871, but this war broke out in 1914. The Second World War, that's also written long before the event, to originate between Great Britain and Germany, to strengthen communism as atheist as antithesis to the Judea Christian culture and bring about a Zionist state in Israel. Did it achieve this objective? Yes. In fact, after this war, Israel in its present form was reinstated under the protection of Britain. And then interestingly enough, a third world war, a Middle Eastern war involving, involving Judaism and Islam and spreading internationally. That's fascinating. Is that uh, on the cards, or what do you think? Certainly sounds like we are on track. Well, here's another quote, uh, just in case people don't like that quote. Massini with Pike developed a plan for three world wars so that eventually every nation would be willing to surrender its national sovereignty to a, to a world government. The first war was to end the Tsarist regime in Russia, the second to allow the Soviet Union to control Europe, the third world war was to be in the Middle East between Muslim and Jews and would result in Armageddon. Interesting. Now, how were they going to do it? Let's read what Albert Pike wrote about these wars and uh, how they were going to be uh, unleashed. He wrote, quote, We shall unleash the nihilist and the atheist, so the destroyer and the atheist, and we will provoke a formidable social cataclysm which in its horror will show clearly to the nations the effect of absolute atheism origin of savagery in the most bloody turmoil. Then everywhere the citizens obliged to defend themselves against the minority of revolutionaries will exterminate these destroyers of civilization and the multitude disillusioned with Christianity will receive the pure light through the universal manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer. The destruction of Christianity and atheism both conquered and exterminated at the same time. Wow, what a clever plan. So you run the two systems which you create up against the other. You create atheism, 
as an antithesis to the Judeo-Christian culture. You have these two clash until they rub each other up, and then out of that, you will get a new world order where you have a new religion, which is far more esoteric and actually honors Satan. Isn't that a rather clever plan? Well, it's very successful. That is why Ordo Abkao, Ordo Abkao is the, the verse, if you like, that uh, Freemasonry uses. This is one of their documents, remember, that I photographed in a Masonic lodge. say two years but has been accelerating over the last several months to the extent that uh, what Obama is planning on doing I mean Obama can see the writing on the wall there's dissatisfaction there's unemployment there's people that are going hungry in this country there's uh, there's civil discord all of this is taking place you can see the writing on the wall it doesn't look good for his election but these people have no plans on leaving, Alex. And, and uh, I'm telling you right now, the people who rioted in the 1960s, the uh, Bill Ayers and the Bernadine Dorns, uh, who were actually the protesters in the 60s and early 70s, the Weather Underground, these are the people who's, who Obama has by his side right now. These are the people who are my source for saying, look, what, what these people are doing, for example, Trayvon Martin, they're using this as uh, a catalyst for racial unrest. The NBC uh, edited the uh, tape. Yeah make it sound racist and the Justice Department got caught with moles fomenting uh, the new Black Panthers in people. I mean, they really are trying to get a race war. Exactly, they, they are, and, and they're 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 working toward that goal, but they're also looking toward the economic factors, and, and this is something that's so important that people really need to understand. What's going on in Europe right now, today, is coming to America. We're we're facing this massive hyperinflation or this massive economic collapse in this country. I mean, your guest Gerald Salenti, uh, right on the money with his information. Uh, it's kind of, this is coming to America, and I'll, and I'll tell you what, uh, DHS knows this. They know that they can't stop this. They know that the dollar is going to collapse. They know that because of this, there's going to be class warfare. And that's the other leg of the table. And so when you have the, the racial component combined with the economic component, the class warfare, I'm going to tell you, it, it, they're expecting riots. They're expecting, and not only expecting it, but they're seeding the, uh, the, the, they're actually seeding it. For example, they've got, my, my source is telling me, according to the information that he's found, for example, Louis Farrakhan and others, now he would not name others, but others are on the payroll of the CIA. This is what my source is saying, allegedly, okay? Allegedly, Farrakhan is on the payroll of the CIA. Why? For what purpose? Well, to enhance and to facilitate the uh, 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 discord, the uh, racial discord in this country. That's what's taking place. But they know they can't stop the collapse of the dollar. Obama, Bernanke working together to tank the dollar, the U.S. dollar, on purpose. I mean, they are they are destroying this country, and they're not going to leave until they're done. Well, when they say when I say destroying the country, they're fundamentally changing the country. Well, when they say when I say destroying the country, they're fundamentally changing the country. Of course, in the words of Obama, changing it to to a Marxist society, which is, is destroying the country. Exactly. Exactly. Here are your coffins, which you paid for with your tax money. There are millions of them waiting for you in different states across the country. 
Each coffin can hold three or four people, and most of you will be crammed into one right after martial law is declared in America. Your President George Bush is an important member of the Illuminati. The master plan of this satanic group of puppets is a new world order. Their goal is to kill 90% of the world's population so they can better control the rest of us, and they will start in America. They have already built many industrial ovens inside the FEMA death camps. These ovens will be used to get rid of the dead bodies. However, even burning these ovens day and night, they will not be faster than the gas killing hundreds to thousands of people at a time. So the plastic coffins will be used to store the rotting bodies. The riots that are coming this summer, that are expected this summer, that are going to be enhanced by the actions of the government this summer. And you've pointed a lot of this stuff out. People have to, people need to listen to you very carefully because you point a, you give a lot of facts out. But uh, uh, it, it's amazing. Uh, now they're going to pale in comparison to what's coming this summer if the timetable is, is correct. And by the way, we've always heard this in bad economic times, but the murders and the racial attacks and the crime craziness and people on edge it is i'm seeing it everywhere and i live in the wealthiest per capita city rated by forbes austin and it's already bad here i can't imagine uh, southern california michigan places like that it, uh, florida i mean it's going to be a powder keg indeed it is and, and that's what they're counting on and, and you know uh, again this whole thing is 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 coming it's going to come like a tsunami it, it's going to hit us like a ton of bricks there's a lot of people you've woken up a lot of people alex and thank you for that and, and uh, uh but there are a lot of people who just have no clue no idea and one thing my source did tell me that i was very concerned about is the fact that uh you know uh, of course we all know about the fema camps that don't exist of course they do uh, they're disaster relief centers uh, uh, according to uh, you know their names People, when they get hungry and, and they're unprepared, they're going to flock to these camps. And uh, this guy, Albert Pike, who was a Freemasonic god in America um, in the 1800s, Sovereign Grand Commander, Mother Supreme, Council of the World, and all this stuff. They love their titles, these people. Pathetic. Um, and he wrote this. This was in a, 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 a book for Freemasons. Fictions are necessary to the people, and the truth becomes deadly to those who are not strong enough to contemplate it in all its brilliance. In fact, what can there be in common between the vile multitude and sublime wisdom? The truth must be kept secret, and the masses need a teaching proportional to their imperfect reason. That's what they do, is hoard the advanced knowledge and give us a fake version of reality. And Brzezinski talks about this area, he's been talking about this area for a long time, he calls it Eurasia. And he says that to control the world, in effect, in simple terms, you need to control Eurasia, this area of land that includes key places like Afghanistan, Iran, um, the places around the Caspian Sea, this great uh, area of, of oil and gas reserves like Georgia, where they've been having problems uh, recently, Pakistan and all these, this area, which so much of the world is now focusing on, um, is this area of the world going up into Russia and Brzezinski seems to have a morbid a genetic hatred of Russia for some reason, um, and uh, that's what we're seeing. Because there are plans to use Israel and use the Jewish people in Israel to um, uh, manifest a, a massive conflict which will lead to a third world war, which is what these guys are after. And Rahm Emanuel is the man who pulls the strings of uh, Barack Obama along with this guy, another Zionist, called David Axelrod. He was the guy that ran the whole of, um, uh, masterminded the whole of the election campaign, both against Hillary Clinton and against John McCain. And it's Axelrod that is responsible for the words that appear on the teleprompter screens that Barack Obama reads. Yeah, people are starting to call him the teleprompter president. It's so bloody obvious. That's why he never looks ahead. It's right, left, right, left, because that's where the screens are. <laughs> Hello, Barack, over here. Sorry, I'm reading. <laughs> and this is why you're getting uh, the, the policy 
of um, Obama saying Palestinian refugees belong to their own state and do not have a literal right to return to Israel. He's talking about the people who fled 800,000 of them um, at the time of the, the, uh, the bombing uh, uh, Israel into existence in 1948 and have never allowed to be come back to their own land. People forget about this. White phosphorus, pepper bombing, the most crowded piece of land on the planet, the Gaza Strip. We don't target civilians, we just bomb where they live. <laughs> Unbelievable. We're just protecting ourselves. No, no, it's a slaughter. I know I'm hearing, oh, there's a lot of anti-Israeli sentiment. Do you know something? I have a way around that. Stop slaughtering innocent people from the sky. Okay? End of story. And it will go away. And this is important. This is important for, 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 for what's planned to come. We now have a situation in Israel where the extreme of the extreme has taken the reins of power. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, he, he's talked about, these are his words uh, summarized, he wants a violent reoccupation of Gaza to liquidate its elected government. And he pledges to thwart the Iranian threat once and for all. He's now got this guy, um, Lieberman, as his foreign minister, and this man's so far right, he topples over, right? Um, and he's got uh, Barak as the defense minister in this new government, and he was defense minister that oversaw the uh, pepper bombing of the Gaza Strip. And this is um, uh, uh, Martin Van Krefeld. He's a, a, a well-known historian in Israel, and this is what he said publicly. We possess several hundred atomic warheads and rockets and can launch them at targets in all directions, perhaps even at Rome. Most European capitals are targets for our air force. We have the capability to take the world down with us, and I can assure you that that will happen before Israel goes under. They have a policy a policy of not saying if they've got no nuclear weapons or they haven't. They just don't talk about it. And a guy called um, Mordecai Venunu, a wonderful Israeli man, um, went to jail for, I think it was 18 years, for exposing the fact publicly that they did have nuclear weapons. And now we've got this thing, well, Iran's going to have nuclear weapons. What? The idea, and we're seeing it almost complete now, from the start was to drive out the Palestinian people, not uh, be at uh, one with them, not share power with them, not share the land with them. The green bits of Palestinian land over the period of time up to the year 2000, and it's gone on since then, as uh, illegal settlements are um, uh, put in um, Palestinian land. And one of the people that lives in an illegal settlement is Lieberman. As an Australian newspaper said this week, he must be the only foreign minister in the world who doesn't actually live within the borders of his own country. And the Middle East policy in Obama's administration is by uh, Bilderberg, uh, George Mitchell, Bilderberg, uh, Council on Foreign Relations, by the notorious uh, uh, little Kissinger, Richard Holbrook, who um, played a major part in breaking up the former Yugoslavia in, in wars, etc., so it could be absorbed into NATO and the uh, European Union, which it is being now. Um, um, he's Bilderberg Group, Council on Foreign Relations, Trilateral Commission. He's now in charge of Pakistan-Afghanistan policy. And this man, who is an arch-Zionist called Dennis Ross, he's now in charge of Iran policy. <laughs> um, what it's building to is a... Um, an effort, and Brzezinski is behind this among many others, to create a conflict out of the Middle East and in this area we're looking at, to uh, bring about a third world war. And the third world war will be, and this was, was, was been written about um, in, 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 in the past, that there were going to be three world wars to bring this new world order into, into being. A, new, a, a war that would finish off the superpowers and bring them whole world under the uh, control of a world government which will then dictate to every country. We have a responsibility to act.
Bomb me ready, got rock, sand, rust, you're trying to run, sex, bomb me ran, wah, bomb, wah, bomb me ran, wah, bomb, 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 bomb, wah, bomb me ran, got rock, sand, rust, you're trying to run, sex, bomb me ran, wah, bomb, wah, bomb me ran, I-A-E-A says no, 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 sad, but we got to go, bomb me ran. The time for our leadership is now. It was the United States and the United Kingdom and our democratic allies that shaped a world in which new nations could emerge and individuals could thrive. And even as more nations take on the responsibilities of global leadership, our alliance will remain indispensable to the goal of a century that is more peaceful, more prosperous, and more just. The nature of our leadership will need to change with the times. shortly after 9-11, but our war is not against Islam. Bin Laden was not a Muslim leader. He was a mass murderer of Muslims. Indeed, Al-Qaeda has slaughtered scores of Muslims in many countries, including our own. So his demise should be welcomed by all who believe in peace and human dignity. <laughs> I receive this honor with deep gratitude and great humility. It's an award that speaks to our highest aspirations. For all the cruelty and hardship of our world, we are not mere prisoners of fate. And yet I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the considerable controversy that your generous decision has generated. In part, this is because I am at the beginning and not the end of my labors on the world stage. So all eyes are now on Pakistan, where Osama bin Laden was killed, and reporters are suggesting that the government was sheltering the terrorist leader for years. But how is this possible if the country is indeed one of the major victims of terrorism? I mean, do you think that's really believable? Let me say, first of all, what I, what I have to say about bin Laden is based on a 500-page, rather exhaustive book that I've written, 9-11 Synthetic, made in USA. Uh, I think this is an, a completely manufactured, invented story created out of whole cloth by the U.S. intelligence community, primarily for the purpose of targeting 
Pakistan, and there's been a build-up to it. We had a very harsh statement condemning Pakistan in one of the terror reports of the U.S. government. We had Admiral Mullen visiting Pakistan, accusing them of being accomplices of the terrorist Haqqani network. We then had the CIA limited hangout operation known as WikiLeaks targeting Pakistan. The Washington Post putting that on the front page. The center of gravity of al-Qaeda was always Pakistan, and now we have this manufacturing uh, story, uh, Abbottabad, allegedly the hiding place, the lair of, of bin Laden for the past uh, six years. It's totally fantastic, but the purpose is clear enough. They're targeting Pakistan for more attacks. The Chinese government has understood this immediately. We have a very strong statement from China this morning, basically saying to the U.S., if you mess with Islamabad, you will be messing with Beijing, and this will get into something much bigger than you thought. The main danger right now is false flag terror events, in reality organized by the U.S. or by NATO intelligence, that will be blamed on Pakistan. And indeed, we have this from several CIA people in the media here saying there will be revenge terror attacks, but they'll be coming from the Inter-Services Intelligence Network, that is the much demonized ISI of Pakistan. And you can see this is a complete setup, so people need to be vigilant in that regard. The U.S. says it has photos of slain bin Laden. ABC News is reporting right now that they may, in fact, release them today. But why do you think they release them right away, get all the skepticism over with, over uh, the death of bin Laden? I, I can't speculate about that, but I'm sure that whatever they release will essentially be a fraud. The real bin Laden has been dead for a long time. And for the last six, seven, eight years, You've been hearing primarily audio statements from a kind of production company located probably in Pakistan. All right, Unemployed I'm, I'm, actors. I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry, Webb. I'm going to move on here now because this is one of the many conspiracy theories that we've been talking about yesterday and today. Yes, they're out there. You're talking about it. We had a guest talk about it yesterday. The Taliban's talking about it. I'm going to move on. Many agree that the U.S. foreign policy prompted the attack of, uh, prompted the dawn of Al Qaeda back in the 80s. That's no secret. Now sure. it's supporting rebels in Libya. Who allegedly have links with extremism. How long do you think the U.S. may continue a pattern of arming extremists or possible extremists who later there's blowback from? Well, this is the, the tremendous contradiction is that the United States is openly supporting al-Qaeda forces, uh, which re represent a large part of the Benghazi rebel council in Libya. In Libya or in Yemen, al-Qaeda is part of, one, it's one of the main tools of the U.S. in destabilizing the government. One suspects that in Syria and in Algeria that's also the case. But then, in sharp contradiction, uh, if you're al-Qaeda in Afghanistan or Pakistan, then you have to be bombed. And this is an unsustainable contradiction. It just makes absolutely no sense. I think what we're actually seeing is the decline of the U.S. empire. Uh, if you look back at the, the fall of the Spanish, the French, the British empires, in those cases, the fall of the empire has been accompanied by world wars. Now, if the United States decides to go after Pakistan, trying to split Pakistan into Sindh, Balochistan, Punjab, Pashtunistan, you're going to get a collision between the United States and China. And at that point, Russia will also have to respond in some way. What you're seeing is how the decline of empire can lead to, to uh, war by miscalculation. The U.S. ruling elite is, is in a frenzy because they are trying to stop Saudi Arabia and Pakistan from leaving the empire, from making a jailbreak, from bolting uh, out from under U.S. hegemony. So that is why they've chosen to liquidate hundreds of billions of dollars they've invested in the mythological figure of, of bin Laden. They wouldn't be doing that if it weren't something big. It goes far beyond Obama's fortunes at the polls. It's an attempt to try to save the U.S. position in the world. Involvement in the internal affairs of sovereign countries often consists in co-opting members of opposition parties, uh, financing them through uh, the National Endowment for Democracy, Freedom House, various private foundations, uh, essentially with a view to implementing regime change. In other words, installing, uh, installing politicians who are chosen and who are there to replace an existing political system. And that is what we call 
a client regime. And there are many client re U.S. client regimes around the world. Okay? We, don't, we don't even need to mention names. Uh, uh, we, we have client regimes in the former Soviet Union. In Georgia is a good case of a client regime. And, and we see how, how the United States, through its foundations, manages also to, to influence the, the, uh, the course of, of politics in, in, in Georgia for specifically for, uh, uh, for serving U.S. Uh, strategic objectives in, in that region. The support to members of opposition parties in Russia should come as no surprise. Um, the Russian government uh, is, uh, is a government which uh, states its points of view. If the United States doesn't like these points of view, or if they, are, if they consider that Russia is not on the right wavelength, they will uh, attempt to uh, weaken or destabilize uh, the, the government, the existing government, and contemplate the possibility of a regime change, as they have in numerous countries around the world. There are countries which have their own independent governments, which don't take orders from Washington, uh, in Latin America, in the Middle East. And these countries, if they do not abide by U.S. demands, the United States will attempt a regime change. And how do they undertake a regime change? They establish links with opposition political parties, uh, they may be involved in covert operations through, uh, through the intelligence apparatus. And, and of course, these opposition, opposition groups are often financed directly uh, by, uh, by U.S. foundations. This is part of a modus operandi. It's, it's really the ABC of, uh, of U.S. foreign policy. I think it's very important that this issue be discussed and debated, and it, it's certainly very important that it's now being debated in Russia, because from our standpoint, uh, this kind of, of um, uh, diplomacy by the United States is unacceptable, that, uh, that the United States would um, finance either directly from the State Department or through various front organizations such as the National Endowment for Democracy should support uh, local groups to serve U.S. interests domestically. Uh, the National Endowment for Democracy is really an outgrowth of the CIA. Um, and, uh, and you can look at its profile. Uh, it, it has, in fact, uh, one of the former directors of the National Endowment for Democracy said, we are doing legally what the CIA used to do. Okay, and uh, you look at their mandate, well, their mandate is to support uh, U.S.-style democratization throughout the world. Now, U.S.-style democratization, we know what it is. We know what it is. It's, it's the antithesis of democracy. How can a country which uh, is involved in targeted assassinations, torture, um, the whole process of financing and, and manipulating elections, um, present itself as a role model. The European Union is concerned about the situation in Russia because of certain restrictions on democratic liberties, such as free press. Do you understand the EU's concerns? I understand them. That's a long-standing tradition of European countries. They impose their standards and rules on others. Remember what happened during the colonization period, say, in Africa. I get the impression that this old tradition has transformed into democratization. Europeans and our Western partners in general like to use this method whenever they want to get a tighter grip on a certain region. As for violations, they happen everywhere. Let's take, for example, human rights violations in the French penitentiary system, in French prisons. Yes, there are violations, and we should fight against them. In fact, I think even in the Russian political system, there are certain things that need to be adjusted or corrected or enhanced. 
But that's a natural process by which our society becomes mature. Look at our past. Initially we had the Tsar, then Stalin, and then the communist regime. It wasn't until the early 1990s that we started building a society based on different principles. It takes time. Do you think the democratic model, the Western model, is not very good for Russia at this point? Can you explain to me what you mean by the Western democratic model? There's one model in France and a different model in the US. At some point in the past, I had a lot of discussions with my American colleagues. I would ask them, how come the majority of your people voted for one person, yet another person becomes president? That's because they have the electoral college. My American colleagues replied to me, don't touch this thing. We've got used to this system and we won't change it. So we don't lecture them. Well, what makes you think you can lecture us? We can decide for ourselves what we should do. Now, the U.S. and its Arab allies are quietly pursuing a missile defense system across the Persian Gulf. American officials say the project is aimed at repelling a possible attack from Iran. Now, Washington has boosted sales of detection systems and missile batteries to countries like Kuwait, uh, the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia. Uh, this map right here shows how the Iranian state is being increasingly encircled by all kinds of U.S. military bases and weapons. Soraya Sepapur Ulrich, an independent researcher and writer, believes a hypothetical threat from Tehran is a pretext for further expansion in a key strategic area. America believes in realigning its forces to better control and dominate the world. And um, I, I think that perhaps, and it needs the cooperation of the countries involved. And I, and I think that Iran being made into a threat um, has allowed the Arab countries to cooperate with America be, uh, because really they rely on America for their internal securities. And which, which actually is an important point here because the internal securities of some of these countries are now in jeopardy. And with every base that America creates, with every uh, missile defense shield or Patriot missile, everything that it exports to any given country, it has personnel going with it. So one has to question whether these are to calm down the potential threats that might arise in countries that um, have always supplied America with the oil it needed and the soldiers, or whether it's actually um, for a, a, a any, a wider purpose. Washington did join hands with those seeking to replace Gaddafi and take over power in Libya. To help prop them up, the U.S. pledged to funnel billions of dollars of Gaddafi's frozen assets to the Transitional Council. I am currently drafting legislation at the request of the State Department and the administration that will authorize the transfer of available cash assets to the council. But the support from Washington comes not only in money and Tomahawk missiles, but also in military command. One of the commanders of the Libyan rebel army is General Khalifa Hifter, a longtime Gaddafi defector. He lived in a Washington suburb for the last 20 years, before he took off to Libya in March this year to command the rebel forces. Khalifa Hifter lived just minutes away from CIA headquarters, although any intelligence connections have never been officially confirmed. At the moment we have CIA operatives all over eastern Syria, CIA agents who were there even before Obama recognized it and who have been pouring into eastern Libya, along, working alongside French intelligence and British SAS as well. They are manipulating the agenda of this uh, transitional council. Some analysts say the U.S. is using the turmoil in Libya to propel to power people who would be loyal to their interests. Gaddafi, uh, having been there for 40 years plus, uh, had a will of his own. So he had a significant degree of independence and he had his own policies. You look at this collection of Jibril, Jalil, Yunus and Hifter, these people are foreign agents, they're NATO stooges, they're, they're completely controlled and they will never 
be able to assert any kind of independent, autonomous Libya. The risks of the puppet regime are that this will degenerate into chaos. Right now, the rebels can only exist with complete NATO support. A number of leaders who were propped up by Washington have faced popular discontent. In Egypt, Hosni Mubarak had been extensively supported by the U.S. for decades, despite domestic disapproval of his policies. Yemen has seen violent protests over the rule of its president, who many believe has managed to hold on to power only thanks to U.S. support. And the government of Hamid Karzai in Afghanistan has been struggling with public discontent for years. The U.S. and its allies will go in to establish some sort of a regime that we approve of, but the process is not going to be a democratic one, and in the long run, the odds are overwhelming that the Libyan people will reject that regime. The American policymakers who talk about this kind of thing are not themselves deluded. They know perfectly well what they're doing. They know it's not going to work in the long run, but they have other reasons for wanting to have short-term gains. Having clearly taken sides in the Libyan civil war, Washington is now seeking to forge strong ties with whoever might come to power there, but Emily say such an overwhelming support, financial, military, and political, never comes without strings attached. I'm going to check out reporting from Washington, RT. The head of Britain's armed forces insists that killing Colonel Gaddafi will be within the rules as NATO appears to ready itself for a long war. But investigative journalist Tony Gosselin says it's the alliance that should be brought to justice, not the Libyan leader. This is a political decision. It should never be a military decision. I think the reason that the military chief has announced it is really to save the face of our politicians here in Britain who are pushing and pushing this whole matter way beyond what was agreed at the United Nations Security Council. Uh, that is a serious, serious problem and this is why uh, the Russians and others are now saying uh, there must be a ceasefire. Why is it, we have to ask ourselves, that the British and NATO particularly, uh, you know, this is a NATO initiative now, uh, have decided that they want to uh, intervene so heavily in the civil war rather than let the Libyan people decide for themselves the outcome of how they want the politics in their country to be in the future. This is, uh, I would consider, a war crime under the present situation and it goes way outside the present UN resolution. We don't see Colonel Gaddafi going into uh, foreign countries, invading them, bombing them, attacking them. We don't see these long protracted wars carried out by Colonel Gaddafi. I think he's the least of our problems and we should see uh, Tony Blair and George George Bush in the dock at the International Criminal Court. Who gave coalition forces in Libya the right to eliminate Gaddafi? Well, that's the question Vladimir Putin's been asking during an official visit to Denmark. The Russian Premier also said NATO's effectively joined one of the warring sides in the conflict, and more responsible action should be taken instead. Body's Daniel Bushel joins us now, live for this, in Brussels. Uh, Daniel, so um, the Russian Prime Minister has effectively lashed out on the operation there in Libya. Yes, he's made a speech in Denmark and he was very angry. He says that uh, Gaddafi is not the best person in the world. Sure, he's made uh, many mistakes, done many bad things, but that does not give the coalition the right to bomb indiscriminately. His words were that they are bombing Gaddafi's palaces in Tripoli every night. Uh, now, coalition said that their plan was not to get rid of Gaddafi. So his question was, uh, Mr. Putin's question was, why are the coalition forces obviously making this effort to go after Colonel Gaddafi himself? Now, we also heard that uh, the experts here in Brussels have confirmed that there's, there is bombing going on by the coalition forces, uh, which is not being covered by the media uh, here in the European Union. Ms. Putin added that oil was uh, a key interest for the Western powers, for the European powers who have gone into Libya, that they want to get rid of Gaddafi and install people who are more favorable to the European Union so that European companies can control the oil reserves. Let's have a listen to exactly what Mr. Putin had to say. The coalition said destroying Gaddafi was not their goal. Then why bomb his palaces? Now some officials have claimed that eliminating him was in fact their goal. Who gave them that right? Did he have a fair trial? Returning to the no-fly zone, the bombings are destroying the country's entire infrastructure. When the so-called civilized world uses all its military power against a small country, destroying what's been created by generations, I don't know if that's good. 
Mr. Putin said that so they have to give the Libyan people time to sort out their own problems, and there's really double standards here, here he added. Uh, there are several other parts of the region in the Middle East and North Africa which is facing pretty much civil war situations, but which the West is either ignoring or not really paying the same amount of attention to. Now, Washington has strongly backed the Libyan opposition since revolutionary wave engulfed the state. It's now equally enthusiastic in its support against Syria's President Bashar al Assad. But the concern is whether America's decision to take sides could backfire on its closest Middle East ally, Israel. RT's Ghani Jijikian looks at the possible repercussions of US policy. As nations in the Middle East and North Africa are torn between the struggle to bring about change and the struggle not to let that change ruin their lives, Washington views the Arab Spring as an opportunity to finally see some of its longtime foes crumble. Even though Iran is not an Arab country, the Arab Spring could spread to... Absolutely. Uh, and I think in many ways it's a matter of time mm. before that kind of change and reform and revolution occurs in, uh, in Iran. Under the umbrella of Arab revolutions, Washington is also beating the drums of regime change in Syria, Iran's closest ally in the region. Violence within the country has been widely condemned. Countries like Russia and China call for both sides in Syria to talk and end the bloodshed, while America is blaming Assad alone. The transition to democracy in Syria has begun and it's time for Assad to get out of the way. I think Assad's days, uh, just like Gaddafi, are numbered. Let's hope that Bashar Assad is next in line. They've overthrown Gaddafi. They're going to have a proxy or client government in Tripoli. The next step is Syria. They want to overthrow Syria next to take advantage of any movement that exists in Syria to overthrow the Assad government. Not that they have a more democratic government, a more humane government but a government that is allied with the United States. And after Syria, the next target will be Iran itself. Watching regimes go down one by one, American politicians are filled with new hopes and aspirations. Some went as far as to predict the Arab Spring would spread all across the world. What this is all about is the Arab Spring, and Bashar Assad is next. And even places like China and Russia and other places, they are very uneasy. This is about people aspiring for freedom. And that's what the Libyan people have just achieved. It's wishful thinking on the part of John McCain, but it speaks volumes to where the real orientation is in Washington, not just to the Republicans, but the Democrats, too. So they would like to overthrow the government in China. They would like to overthrow the government in Russia. They would like to overthrow the government in Venezuela and Cuba or wherever people are independent of the dictates of Washington. But when it comes to Syria and Iran, Washington doesn't seem to be just fantasizing about revolutions. It actively fosters the process by pledging support for anti-government movements there. But some say this might eventually turn against America's closest ally in the region, Israel. What you have with, uh, uh, with Hamas uh, could essentially spread to many more places, and then you'd have a much, much larger population base in a, an extremely hostile position towards uh, the very existence of Israel. By throwing its support behind revolution makers, analysts say Washington is seeking to increase its influence and control in these countries. Let's look at how things have been in the control department so far. Egypt. Thousands protest against the U.S.-backed military there that's still in power. Last week, Egyptians stormed the Israeli embassy, enraged by the killing of five Egyptian border guards. In Libya, a Washington-supported leadership is taking over, but the country is at risk of plunging into tribal war. Syria, the opposition includes those with radical agendas. So the aftermath of the so-called Arab Spring remains very murky and difficult. Yet Washington seems to be using the Arab Spring to fulfill its long-time goals. 30 Dutch troops and 20 German colleagues are the first in a large NATO deployment also involving U.S. forces. The mission comes after Turkey asked for help protecting its southeastern cities from a possible Syrian conventional or chemical missile attack. Iran could attack the United States in a much more fearsome way. New York could eventually be on Iran's hit list. U.S. media reports. Desperate new pleas come out of the country. The oppressors and the oppressed stop the killing. Echoing Washington's repeated warnings. We will carry out the attack. American officials have labeled Syria and Iran as grave threats to global security. However, former U.S. Attorney General Ramsey Clark says the biggest threat to world peace is his own country's military and foreign policy.
In an exclusive interview with RT, the lawyer and activist says America's next catastrophic mistake will likely be a war with Iran. My impression is that um, Israel is pressing for an assault before the election, <laughs> and that the Obama administration is resisting that without favoring Iran in any way, but uh, simply as a domestic political matter. Well, the U.S. can't really afford to, to get involved in another war, can it? Well, I hope not. <laughs> but that's not the way it works. I mean, you do crazy things, and that's, that's why the world's such a mess. If Israel strikes and there's retaliation, that the United States will intervene. And I don't think it's Obama's choice, but I think he's, he thinks that um, if he doesn't act with Israel, that it'll be too costly in the election and he'll do it. You, you have to see the American system to know this, or to really understand it fully. Um, if he loses this election, he's a failed president. He, all of his major decisions will be primarily affected by how they impact on the coming election. Because if he loses that election, anything he accomplished, and he accomplished a few things, health care and things like that, are better than they were. They're, not, they're far from ideal and far from what, in the, if he has the Congress in a second section, session, he could do. But um, he, he's, uh, he struggled against enormous pressures. The Pentagon's ability, I mean, I've watched presidents who, President Johnson was one of those guys coming in from the Pentagon, you just think, my God, they know everything, I don't know nothing. With respect to Syria, um, while speaking to the United Nations Security Council, uh, the Syrian ambassador uh, reportedly quoted a statement um, that you said nearly 22 years ago. He said, quote, the UN, which was established to prevent the encouragement of war, has become itself a tool for war. How do you perceive the circumstances surrounding Syria right now and the, the U.S. and European actions and uh, campaign for some type of intervention? Well, Syria is um, under extreme international and to some degree domestic pressure and violence um, for only one reason. <laughs> And it's the same reason that gave us uh, Iraq and uh, Afghanistan and Libya. Syria is a part of the effort to eliminate uh, every independent Arab government, independent of U.S. control. You think that's the goal? It's not humanitarian reasons? Oh my God, no. I mean, it's, it's, it's geopolitical. Russia accused Libya of training the Syrian militia currently fighting government forces. It was part of a broader discussion of the situation in the Arab countries, with Moscow also demanding NATO apologize for causing civilian casualties during last year's air raids in Libya. Maltese Marina Portnoy has been following the meeting in New York. A new report that was quietly released by the United Nations on Friday. That report was an investigation that found in part that NATO has not sufficiently investigated uh, the air raids it conducted on Libya in 2011 that killed at least 60 civilians and injured at least uh, 55 more people. Despite the findings of this 220-page report, NATO officials have refused so far to further investigate uh, the fatalities or the casualties that uh, this report was referring to. Now, the Russian ambassador to the United Nations, Vitaly Cherkin, also uh, went on to say that order has not yet been established uh, nearly or more than a year after NATO carried out its airstrikes to uh, allegedly bring a more peace, a peaceful and secure circumstance to Libya. Uh, the situation is still very dangerous. We have expressed concern about the uncontrolled proliferation of Libyan arms in the region. However, it is not just the weapons that are going abroad. We have received information that in Libya, with the support from the authorities, there is a special training center for the Syrian revolutionaries and that people are sent to Syria to attack the legal government. This is completely unacceptable according to all legal bases. This activity undermines the stability in the Middle East. We 
think that Al-Qaeda is in Syria and therefore there is an issue. It's transporting the revolution now turning into transporting of terrorism. In the aftermath of what happened in Libya one year later, uh, the situation on the ground, many critics say, is not safer by any means. Syria. In Syria, we're now seeing a situation where the Arab League is calling for a halt to violence and the beginning of dialogue. And Western countries and the capitals of some countries of the region are making calls to the contrary, expressly recommending the opposition hold no talks with the Assad regime. It looks like a political provocation on an international scale. Yes, violence has to be stopped, but this demand has to be addressed to the authorities and the armed groups in the Syrian opposition. So, uh, so what, what's, uh, what's your take on this? Do, do you agree that the calls coming from the West are, are not helping to stabilize the situation in the region? Uh, surely not. Certainly, Mr. Mr. Lavrov is on very firm ground there. I've just completed about a one-week uh, fact-finding tour of the country. I've been in Homs, I've been in Tartus, Banyas, I've been in the military hospital here in, in Baghdad, and I can tell you what, uh, what uh, average, everyday Syrians of all ethnic groups, Christian, Alawite, Sunni, Shiite, Druze, uh, what they say about this is that they are being shot at by snipers. Um, in Homs in particular, people complained that there are terrorist snipers who are shooting at civilians, men, women, and children, blind terrorism, random killing, uh, simply for the purpose of destabilizing the country. Uh, I, I think th I would not call this a civil war by any stretch of the imagination. I think that's a that's a very very uh, misleading term in the following sense. What you're dealing with here are death squads. You're dealing here with terror commandos, the kind of thing that everybody remembers from Argentina and the uh, Central America. This is a typical CIA method. In this case, it's a joint production of CIA, MI6, Mossad, the DGSE of the French. It's got money coming from Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and Qatar. And it has a couple of interesting managers. Um, the manager I think you should point to perhaps most is a guy called Khadam. Khadam was the foreign minister in this country for quite a couple of decades. He's almost 80 years old. He operates from Paris. And I think he's being groomed by, by NATO as the new dictator of some Mr. kind Tarp, of Mr. Tarpley, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. If I could just jump in for a moment. It, it's very interesting how you bring in the, the issue of that there are, there are unknown snipers, there are terror commandos, uh, death squads with, with, uh, with links uh, to the West and the West, uh, West's allies in Saudi Arabia, for example. But Assad's rule is increasingly being called illegitimate. But isn't the, the, Euro, the, the U.S. and that of Europe a concern that getting rid of the Syrian president could just cause even more violence? For example, what we're seeing right now in Tahrir Square in Egypt. Well, after, after Libya becoming a bloodbath with 150,000 dead, and now with Egypt showing what it was all along, there was no revolution there. It was a complete failure, and now people are beginning to, to understand it. Notice that, nevertheless, uh, Mrs. Clinton and Ms. Rice at the United Nations are continuing to push this bankrupt, discredited model of the color revolution, the CIA people power coup, backed up by terrorist troops, uh, people from Al-Qaeda, people from the Muslim Brotherhood, people from Salafist organizations and, and so forth. And uh, I've, I've heard this now from some very important religious authorities here. There's a growing movement inside the Islamic community here which says we want uh, reconciliation, we want law and order, we want legality, we don't want fat fanatics to run the show. The fanatics are being brought in by the Western powers. So the, so the, fanat so the, the fanatics the are coming in by, by, by the Western powers. You're seeing a, a fair amount of unification yes. among the Muslims there. But let's, I mean, let's, let's draw some comparisons, if we may. Uh, UN Resolution 1973 for Libya to protect civilians there. Do you think, is the grand plan here for Syria, uh, that of the Western, Western states, to get in there for race regime in Syria, and if that is their plan, then what is the point? What is there to gain? A very, very important thing is that this is the most tolerant society in the Middle East. This is one place where all kinds of people live together in, I think, remarkable harmony. And again, it's a, it's a very wide variety. Muslims of, the, of all kinds, Christians of all kinds, right? Christian uh, Greek Orthodox, uh, Greek Catholics, Melkites, Syriacs, uh, many, many other kinds, Druzes, Kurds. Uh, 
and so forth. This is a model of the peaceful coexistence of various ethnic groups. Now, the U.S. policy, I think right now, is to smash the Middle East according to ethnic lines. In other words, if you can have a divide and conquer policy which says the, Le the Christians will be kicked out of Lebanon and the Christians will be, say, kicked out of Syria in the way that they have been kicked out of, of Iraq, and ironically a lot of them went to Syria, you can, you can get a, a situation where all of these countries are, are fatally weakened. Um, the way in which it's introduced is if you look at Syria, the main centers of trouble are on the Turkish border, the Syrian border with uh, Jordan, with Iraqi Kurdistan and then with Lebanon. And I think Lebanon, thanks to Saad Hariri, may be the main one. It, but it's I'm, a, I'm it's a complete we are running very, very long time here. We're running, I'm so sorry, we are running on a lot of time. But if I may, with, with, with Western powers calling for restraint uh, on both sides in Egypt, why do they only take a one sided approach when it comes to what's going on in Syria? Well, this is, it's all the tactics of demagogy and the, the modulation of demagogy from one, one minute to the next. But what, what we have here in, in Syria is a cynical media campaign because I've, I've been in Homs. When you go to Homs and you go to the Zara neighborhood, which is supposed to be the hottest point in the whole country, you find people who are pro-Assad. They're concerned, number one, about mazout. They want to have heating oil because the winter is coming and it's getting cold. And you ask them, what is your demand? They say, we we want the Syrian army to come in here. We want the Syrian army posted on the roofs of the houses with helicopters and tanks. Stop these snipers from killing us. Don't let these, these black uh, hooded figures, which is what they are, uh, pretending to be deserters when they're really maybe from Chechenia, they're from uh, Libya, they're from uh, Afghanistan or Pakistan. Foreign fighters have been brought in here by the CIA and the other Western services. And that is what's going on. And that is, I think, a very, very large part of it. Uh, and in, in the city of Homs, for example, in one hospital, they were telling us it was five dead and seven wounded on one day. And what was it? It's all snipers. It's all these terrorists who are shooting the civilian population. Of course, when Al Jazeera arrives, they say, oh, those, those deaths are the responsibility of the Syrian army. That is absolute baloney. This is a Goebbels big lie campaign. There is no civil war here. There is no insurrection. There is no mass political movement against us. These are very, very limited, minor, strictly localized uh, phenomena. This, this looks nothing like Libya. I know what a civil war in a modern Arab country looks like. I've been in Libya during the summer. There's no civil wars. I think we have to go back a little bit. Remember, the difference of Obama compared to Bush Cheney is that Bush Cheney were the advocates of direct U.S. military action. U.S. would bomb and invade countries like Afghanistan, Iraq, others. With Obama, it's much more nuanced. It's based on deception, dissembling, and treachery. And the strategy is called buck passing. Buck passing means if you have an ally like Turkey, which is showing very disturbing signs of independent action, and then you have a country like Syria, which is uh, aligned with Russia and China, the way to deal with that is not to have a direct U.S. military attack, but to play one against the other. In particular, I'm thinking of 2010. Turkey was showing signs, I think, of world leadership in some ways. Turkey combined with Brazil to try to cool down the question of the Iranian nuclear program and back the world away from uh, a general war over that. That's very positive. But that alarmed people here in Washington. So the uh, re result of that was Obama got on the phone with Erdogan and he promised that he would make Erdogan great, that Turkey would become a regional hegemon. And by the way, uh, they were going to go after Syria and the Syrian government would fall. The Syrian government would go down like, uh, like Tunisia with just a couple of days. And Erdogan and Davutoglu bought into that and they've now gone way out on a limb. Uh, I understand about 18 percent of the Turkish population is, uh, is interested in military action against Syria. So there's a tremendous majority against military action, but since Erdogan and Davutoglu control the main party, they can get this vote, which now takes us a step further towards some larger armed confrontation. It's beginning to look more and more like the Spanish Civil War. And remember, if Hillary Clinton gets on the telephone with Davutoglu, she's not telling him to cool it. She's saying, assert your rights, get out in front even more. So 
because of their vanity and ambition and uh, related factors, Erdogan and Davutoglu have, have gone very far down the road. And you wonder, is there a way back for them? I would urge them to find a way back, to pull back from this. This is not in Turkey's interest. Uh, and uh, if we get a conflict between Turkey and Syria, the one who is laughing will be the United States, because they will have disposed of two uh, countries that were resisting the imperial dictates coming from here.